Uh, welcome to the Co-Firing Biomass and Coal-Fired Boilers Hot Topic Hour uh, for today. And as you can see on the screen here, we've got uh, some uh, uh, good speakers, uh, and we're going to be starting out with Desmond Smith, uh, Fernando Preto, and then Kevin Tupin of, of Babcock. So it's a, a, a nice range of subjects to cover uh, both the complete uh, substitution of biomass and the co-firing. And um, let's go to the biographies at this point in time. Ask him to uh, start speaking. So, Desmond, the floor is yours. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I thought I would, um, to take the approach in my presentation this morning, I thought I would talk about a project that we have in which we've gone through the exercise of identifying the key elements for the material receipt and handling system for a 10 to 15 percent uh, direct wood substitution co-firing project for coal in um, a Canadian uh, power plant. So if you'll go ahead and, and go to the next slide. The, um, I guess the way I would begin this is that the European model is to use pellets, which I show in the upper picture there, um, and uh, actually prepare the pellets and transport them to Europe and then to decompose the pellets from um, the solid form into a dust-like form <coughs> and then insert them in, in, uh, in a suspension burning boiler. And that, <coughs> excuse me, it makes a lot of sense to do that because uh, you increase the fuel value of the wood, you densify it, you, you um, reduce the moisture content in the wood to something under 10 percent, often in the 6 and 7 percent range. And you lower your transportation costs, obviously, for um, shipping, so you, you increase the uh, density up to in the mid-40 pounds per cubic foot range. So it has a lot of advantages. And if you if you rather take the approach that you want to direct co-fire wood, which I show in the middle picture with coal, you end up with lots more problems to do that. And um, the, the project that we have underway um, is designed to address and identify these problems and to figure out how we can get around them. So um, obviously, as I list in the text on the side, um, I have uh, I talk about the basic wood density, packing density, and energy density of wood. And I think we're all generally f familiar with these as, uh, as hurdles and challenges in this regard. Uh, ener wood's energy density of uh, eight to eight and a half thousand pounds per our BTUs per pound is, of course, significantly below wood, and, and uh, I think uh, the next speaker is going to talk <laughs> about its consequences in the boiler, which I think are significant. But I'm, I'm going to take a step back and say, right, that's a downstream problem for me. I'm going to try and <laughs> do what I can to improve its uh, condition here at the front end. One of the things that we like to do with the wood is to do some, some kind of aging or conditioning of the wood prior to chipping it or getting it into a, a pre-milling state. Ideally, we love to use standing dead timber because uh, wood in a nat native condition will have a moisture content of something like 45 to 50 percent. Um, pine killed, uh, beetle pine killed trees in the, in the western states, for example, will go to um, a fiber saturation point and below and getting down to something in the 10 to 12 percent range. But um, uh, in practical terms, um, leaving the, sun, the trees out in the sun to dry, we can get them down into the 30 percent range relatively quickly in the matter of months in the summertime and even weeks uh, depending on the weather conditions. And in the 30 percent range, things start to change pretty dramatically. Fiber saturation point for wood is roughly 25 to 30 percent. At that point, uh, when you run it through a chipping and grinding operation, it fractures nicely and uh, you can reduce its size pretty dramatically. Green wood, when you try and grind it to a fine condition, won't grind. It, uh, you certainly can't run it through um, um, coal handling machinery like ball mills and, and rod mills and that sort of thing. It just gums them up. So um, we like to get it at least to 30 percent moisture content before we move ahead so we can get some um, proper size reduction for um, coal fire. Go ahead, Bob, to the next one. We, to, to set the parameters necessary for this particular coal fire project, we went through an exercise in which we actually ground the wood and uh, in this laboratory test setup here that you see through grinders and we, we monitored things like um, the size in and the size out of the material and the specific energy to do the size reduction. So I just have a quick 
picture that shows uh, that equipment in, and what it looked like in our test lab. Go ahead. The, the, there are two materials that I'm going to show you, both pine and spruce wood. The pine wood looks like this. The lower um, line with the squares uh, indicates the pre-grind size distribution of the material. Now, I would note that we've used something that has come to be known in the industry as microchips as our infeed material. And what this is is uh, logs that have been chipped to a six millimeter or quarter inch chip length. This is significantly different than what's been traditionally done in the pulp and paper business where uh, chip lengths are roughly seven eighths to an inch and an eighth uh, long. Now we're chipping them at a quarter of an inch <clears throat> and they look quite, quite small. So when you run a sieve analysis on them, you get that sort of um, 45 degree angle-ish sort of line. Then we ground, we ground them in our hammer mill to produce a fine product that we wanted to, to see it would be suitable for uh, co-injection with coal and a suspension burner. So we used various sizes of screens, and you can see listed on the right-hand side, two, four, and six millimeter openings. And these generated output um, fines materials that are represented by the other lines. And obviously, the, the more steep the line is on the far left side, the smaller the particles are. And they follow the general pattern you'd expect. The six millimeter um, screens produce relatively larger material, and the four smaller, and the two smaller yet. Okay, go ahead to the next line. And you'll notice, oh, sorry, on the bottom you'll see that those chips were 41%. Okay. And uh, then we, uh, we had some spruce chips, which were at 34% moisture, and their size, inlet sizes are relatively the same. They were chipped under the same conditions. And as we run them through the grinder, then we get a better um, separation between the various screen sizes. But you can see they gradually get um, smaller as the screen sizes go down. These Various fractions were caught and kept separately and run through a, um, a test series run by the boiler guys, if I can uh, take an arm's length approach to this, who evaluated the burn conditions of these various uh, fractions. And they determined that the middle section, the so-called four millimeter size fraction, was acceptable for their process. So that, um, that meant that um, but we didn't need to go all the way down to the two millimeter size because the capacity of the grinder is strongly influenced by the, um, the screen hole size in, inside. So we've got a relatively good um, capacity through our system. Um, go ahead, Bob, to the next slide, if you would. Bob, can you hear me? Can you go ahead to the next slide, if you would. There you go. Yeah, right. Uh, there we go. So, so here's um, this chart shows the power use in the grinder by by size, and of course, um, the larger holes uh, use less power per ton. And as the material gets, as the hole size gets smaller, the um, the hammers inside the mill have to do more work to reduce those microchips down to the very small sizes. And of course, we're always concerned about the parasitic load of the grinding process on the on the uh, the process of preparing the wood for co-injection. So, I mean, we want to use as large a material as we can. So in the you know, in the, the middle fraction there was, you know, we end up with um, a machine, a, a grinding machine at this point that's 600 millimeters in diameter, two millimeters long. We have a 600 horsepower motor on it. It has roughly a seven ton per hour throughput capacity at 30 millimeters or at 30 percent moisture content. So that's what that sweet middle spot of uh, operation has turned out to be. Go ahead, Bob. So, so now, um, there is some concern about the moisture content. In the beginning of the process, um, we were given a specification or, um, that the, the chips would come in in green condition. And so we, we were very concerned about the moisture content. And we originally proposed a, a dryer to be included as a part of the project. Um, so the, the bed dryer shown in the bottom picture on the left uh, is, is an example of one of the types that can be used. Um, so uh, we were aware of and, of course, uh, try to uh, educate our customer uh, who is, knows only coal uh, about um, moisture variability as it varies by species, source, age, condition, season, and so forth, and how this is a very difficult thing to control in natural situations. And uh, impressed upon him the, um, the process sensitivity to moisture, and uh, ultimately we talked about either passive um, moisture control strategies involving storage, as I mentioned, handling, blending, and so forth, or using an active moisture control system, such as a, a bed dryer, as, as shown here. And uh, we went down the path <clears throat> quite a ways in order to uh, discuss 
<clears throat> excuse me, and qualify the uh, the need for a, a bed dryer. Go ahead. Why is moisture a big issue? Um, I, I hope I'm not beating this horse too much with this presentation, but um, obviously it has a big impact on chip processing. It has a huge impact on boiler issues as well, uh, which Mr. Prater will probably talk about. So. This is a, an example, uh, just a photograph of a, a coal burning plant, which I, I just can't help but mention this in passing. This is the only coal burning operation in the state of Washington that's just announced they're converting from coal to natural gas. And I was heartbroken because of all of the biofuels that we have in the state of Washington. But um, anyway, there you go. Go ahead, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, in terms of drying, you've got two basic technologies that are used. One is a bed dryer shown in the upper photograph, and the other is a rotary drum dryer, which is shown in the lower photograph. And drying as a, a process in wood preparation is a very energy intensive process. Um, the heat energy to drive the moisture from the wood is significant. And uh, there's always a question as to where this, if this heat energy is coming. Uh, uh, is it waste or excess heat in the process, or, or how do we get it to the to the, um, the dryer and make it happen. The, um, the photograph in the upper case is a bed dryer that's located immediately adjacent to a district heating system in Norway, and it actually runs on waste on excess uh, hot water that's generated by this, um, this heating process. It, it's drying wood chips to uh, sub 10% moisture level from green condition for pelleting, and it's, um, it's basically uh, run only when there's excess heat in the system. So if there isn't sufficient water available, they shut it down, which is a kind of a nice way to do it. I've not seen any other system that's sort of that flexible. The, um, the issues with drawing, of course, uh, a lot of it has to do with air quality issues, um, volatile organic com carbon compounds, and particulates released. The, um, the bed dryer system in the upper, uh, upper photograph uses a low temperature drying process so that the moist air that is passed through the bed from below is exhausted in the ducts that you see at the top and just vented to atmosphere. It's clean enough that it uh, satisfies the air permit requirements of local conditions. The, the lower photograph shows the typical rotary drum dryer in which the inlet temperature can be 1800 degrees. Um, the the uh, VOC emissions and particulate emissions in this process are significant enough that to the right of the photograph is located the um, rapid thermal oxidation unit which in many cases is a, a bottleneck to productivity in this process. So um, RTO treatment of the exhaust gases can be significant, and that's, again, another a very expensive portion of the uh, consideration when you talk about drying and co-firing in this sort of application. Uh, 